Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Brexit Bite. What food businesses need to know. My name is Maria Megan uh, from the Brexit team in the FSAI. I will shortly hand you over to our colleague Deirdre O'Brien from the Environmental Health Service in Dublin Port Health. And following her presentation, to our second speaker, Carol Heavey from the Brexit team in the FCI. Deirdre will provide you with a brief overview of the requirements for import controls of food of non-animal origin and food contact materials, the import controls. Carol will then provide guidance on some of the Brexit issues that food businesses have been asking us for clarification on. Today's event will last 45 minutes in total, 35 minutes for the two presentations and 10 minutes for questions at the end. If you have any questions from the presentations, just put them in the questions box on your screen and we will ask as many as we can at the end. Note that there's also a handout section with some useful documents you can download during the presentation. Our speakers will touch on them during the presentation. If you're on social media, do let us know you're there using the hashtag FSAI events. I'll now pass you over to Deirdre. Hi all, um, my name is Deirdre and I'm a principal in Dublin Port Health. Um, I'm the HSE's Environmental Health Service and uh, we are over Dublin Port and Dublin Airport and together with our colleagues in Rossville Airport, we um, look at food safety checks in uh, of food of non animal origin. I am just going to turn my camera off and then focus on the presentation. So. The categories of food under our control are um, products of non-animal origin, um, excluding for the pesticides, and I'll come to that. We look at composite products if there's less than 50% animal origin, but only in um, the non-animal aspects of that. So we look at things like for allergens or heavy metals um, or those type of problems rather than the veterinary issues, which Department of Agriculture colleagues look at. And we also look at food contact materials, which are materials that come in contact with food. So, for example, spatulas, plastic labels, fish slices, that sort of thing. So, official controls um, is a term that tends to encompass the SBS checks that you will hear an awful lot in the media. Um, and they are, for the food of non-animal origin, they tend to come under three main categories. So, it's kind of a hierarchy of controls. We have um, suspension of entry and like prohibited products and then we have increased and additional controls uh, due to known or emergency risks. Both of those are determined by the EU and we are told that we have to do, full, we are told the percentages of physical checks that we have to do on those products. Uh, I have attached into, well the FSAI have attached into the attachments beside us um, a useful overview of all the food products of non-animal origin legislation that the FSAI FSAI have and the summary there that PDF is the link to that file. Um, I've also attached what we call guide number two from our section and that has an Excel spreadsheet of the CN codes and the products and the country of origin. We also do some routine official controls so these are on a risk basis they're very much decided based on like our national chemical sampling plan our routine checks and we would be sampling products that potentially we are gathering information on or that we have suspicion of uh, non-compliance on um, and they tend to be the, the stuff that we have like discretion over. Um, so some examples from the top two tiers and I might just run a poll now. Um, just going to run a poll. So the question is if you import uh, products from Great Britain, do you enforce any high risk foods of non animal origin? And I'm probably going to then just go through what examples there might be. So they tend to be very specific. These, this list is very specific to product and country of origin. So it's not just, it doesn't just say all of rice, it's rice from China. And they are very everyday products. So you'd be surprised sometimes that the, you might be importing it, but it might not be an increased control because you might be importing it from a country that is not on the increased control list. So it's really important that you know what your products are. Um, so from, from here, we have rice and it's rice from China. We have alpha, alpha toxins in uh, capsicum. Uh, so it's a 20% physical exam rate on that. There's a 10% uh, inspection rate on betel leaves from Bangladesh. 
Uh, we also have, we check for salmonella in black pepper and we check for uh, uh, sesame seeds as well. So the other thing to be aware of there is that sometimes there is multiple, so you might have one product, but multiple countries that need to be checked from. So say for example, peanuts, there is, Senegal, Madagascar, Bolivia, China, Gambia, Ghana, India, and Sudan, those countries all need to, if you're bringing in peanuts from any of those countries, those countries need to, um, are subject to increased controls. Just to be clear, uh, the pesticides um, are not under our control. They're under the Department of Agriculture control. There's a link there for them to, if you want more information from them, but we work very closely with them and it's under the same regulation. So at the end of uh, December, Great Britain will become a third country. And a third country is anything outside the EU. So once it's outside the EU, checks have to happen on it and controls have to happen on it. If you are importing products through Great Britain into Ireland, which will then become the first point of entry, we have to carry out import controls checks on them. So this is the list of the increased controls and say the prohibited or suspension of um, import products that I've just referred to. So those products have to come through a designated point of entry, which would be Dublin Airport, Dublin Seaport, and from the 1st of January, Ross Lair. If the product originates in Great Britain, so say you are growing or manufacturing a product in Great Britain, those are not currently under increased controls, but there's no guarantee that that won't be the case in the future. So this could happen where the EU decides there's a risk coming from a product and we have to put it on our import control checks. The only exception to that is sprouting seeds, but I don't expect that that is a huge, um, there's a huge number of people who do that. Um, so if, so the good news, oh, sorry. The good news is most of the products under our control are green rooted and don't require any intervention. Um, and at the end of the transition period, we will go and we are trying and doing what we can to minimize the impact on uh, the import and the, the flow through the ports. So we are moving to 24 seven operation. Um, we can complete the checks before departure from Great Britain if we have received documentation and only a small percentage of our checks require physical check. So most of our checks are documentary checks, and then a small percentage of that would be a physical check. Um, so if we have received the documentation in advance of that consignment um, departing the UK, we can descend our control to revenue, so be that a release or a check, prior to you even hopping on the ferry. You may not, realize, you may not know that, but we would, if we have received it and we have cleared it, it will go to revenue and therefore, they, when, when you arrive on the, in Dublin, you will receive a green routing from an environmental health control if that check was satisfactory. So when you're sending the documents to, for us to check, there are two different routes depending on if the product was subject to increased control or is a routine check. So if it's subject to increased control, it has to be submitted through traces. And I have another slide on that. And this is a legal requirement. This is an EU piece. All other products can be sent through by email, and I have the email addresses on a different side. We are asking you to put in the subject line in a set format so that we are able to risk assess based on your time and arrival, the products you're bringing in, and the country of origin. If, if you follow this, we'll be able to risk assess and get to the point of um, how and what you, like you're bringing in. So when we see, we have like, you know, hundreds of, of consignments coming through every day, we want to be able to look at our inbox very quickly and see that. Um, we ask also that if you have a, a question or you're not sure whether or not you have to do a check or you have to submit the documents, if you send them in to us, we will do those document checks and we will release it. So if you are unsure, you can proactively send it to us anyway. Um, these are a list of the other sent documents that you might um, need to have. So you need to be able to be prepared in case we come back and ask you a question. So if we ask you a question, uh, that what's in your product say, or can you send us an ingredient list? Have you got that information to hand and can you send it back very quickly? The quicker you get back to us with any queries we have, the quicker the, the document check progresses. Um, yeah, so this is all detailed in a trader notice. and We can send this out to you. So if you send us in a request, 
we can send you out the trader notice and we can make contact with you just to kind of clarify if, what products you're bringing in and if there's any kind of queries on that. So our intention is to minimize delays. And so if we get the right documents with no errors, we can complete the checks quickly. And this is Traces, and uh, this is a new system since last December from our side. It has already been in operation for um, the agriculture side for a long while, so some of you might be uh, aware of that. You have to be registered on this, and you have to submit part one of what is called the Common Health Entry Document at Ched D. And this is the main question here is who will do this for you? Um, so if you are bringing in any of those products for high risk, so I can see from the poll results. There's 18% of people who are bringing in high-risk foods of non-animal origin. You need to know who it is in your area who are doing that. And some 19% of people don't know. So the, the main thing there is to go back in and check what products you're bringing in and what countries of origin they are. Um, if you can... I'm just waiting for the catch up. Uh, so main thing here then is to consider who is going to submit your documentation and who is going to respond to any information that might be required or requested. We are operating 24-7, so if we come back to you with a query, we need to get a response before we can release that product. Another way of minimizing delays is in prior notifying your consignment. So we will take prior notification of your consignment and your documents up to uh, like you know, 24 hours, 48 hours prior to your arrival. So if you know that your consignment is going to be coming in, in on the 3rd of January, you can send that information into us. If you don't have an MRN, you put advance notice on it, and then you just send in the MRN from Revenue once you receive that information, and we can release that product with Revenue then once we've completed the document check. Ensuring the country of our origin is accurately declared is really important for us. If you are bringing in rice and you have said rice and country of origin UK, we know that they don't grow rice in the UK, so it might flag a concern as to where does that rice come from because we have rice from China on our overarching um, high-risk food list. So ensuring that country of origin is accurately declared will prevent us having to come back to you with questions and should allow things to be rooted correctly in the first instance. Then back to the reminder here on traces. So if you're using an agent, are they registered on traces and can they use it? And we have um, really helpful environmental health colleagues who have uh, spent a lot of time with, with agents getting them onto traces and getting them used to it. So we can make sure that you are on it, but we need to know that you are importing foods, the high risk foods of non-animal origin to do that. The other things to consider are loading of consignments and how that consignment is presented to us if we have to do a physical exam. So this is in terms of minimizing delays. I have two examples there of two consignments that we would have received, now these are from existing third countries. But you can see one of them is a very easy unload. We'd be able to do our inspection, we'd be able to complete that, that physical exam very quickly. The second is a handball out of those products. And we would have to manually, physically find the product in that consignment and how we, how we would, um, and then, and then inspect it. So we are asking then to, for you to inform us that you are importing foods of non-animal origin from Great Britain. So the two email addresses are there from Dublin and from Rosvera. So if you are importing through Dublin, please email the Dublin email address. And if you're importing through Rosvera, please email the Rosvera email address. Uh, this is so that we can help get you prepared. Uh, we will then check what types of food products you are importing, check that there's no requirement for increased controls, and we will also put you on our mailing list. So the changes to the increased controls changes every six months. So we will send that around every six months, and you'll be able to check if your products are on that or if they have come onto it. Then I just want to mention export certificates, um, not necessarily under my section, but under my environmental health service overall for the products that we supervise, for the premises that we supervise. So if you export a product to the, UK, to the UK, the UK government will decide what products require an export certificate. If you are a HSE supervised premises, the link for that is there. So you can obtain your export certificates from that, but I would recommend you contact your local EHO and have a conversation with them as well. 
And then just finally, in summary, we are trying to minimize delays as much as possible. So check if any of your products are subject to increased controls. Know who will complete traces. Send the documents into us before arrival. And if you have questions, send those documents into us before arrival. Um, the majority of our products will be routine and risk assessed and will progress through the port. Um, and if you can, if you if you have any queries, come back and ask us. Send the email into us, and we will very quickly be able to say yes or no. And if we need to go for further information or look for further advice, we will do that. And then finally, just to say thank you very much for listening to me. The two email addresses are there again, and I there is very good FSAI training on the power uh, there. The link is there on the FSAI website that does an overview of the whole of um, food import controls. Uh, for food safety um, that I would recommend. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Deirdre. Um, so my name is uh, Carol Heavey and I work in the Brexit section of the Food Safety Authority of Ireland. And this morning, I'm just going to go through some of the queries that we're getting in and some of the questions that we're getting asked and uh, to go through some of those just to clarify some things. So I'm going to come off camera now until I do the presentation and then I'll come back on again for the question and answer session. So Brexit will affect your food business if you buy food from, supply food to or move food through Great Britain. The buying or selling of food contact materials like packaging will also be affected by Brexit. You need to think about your products and your suppliers, and you need to see if they source food from Great Britain. You will need to check also that they're ready for the 1st of January 2021. This is only 58 days away, so it's a very short period of time to get ready. Just to say the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland will apply from the 1st of January 2021, whether or not there is a free trade agreement. Under the protocol, Northern Ireland is legally part of the UK customs territory, but subject to certain provisions of EU law, including EU food law. This means that there will be no change to the current procedure for trade in food between Ireland and Northern Ireland. This is why I am referring to Great Britain rather than the UK, because at the end of the transition period, the relationship between Great Britain and the EU will be different from that of Northern Ireland and the EU. Food businesses are contacting the FSCI looking for clarification on what needs to be changed on food labels and when these changes need to be done. This links in with the requirements for placing food on the EU market before the end of the transition period and the difference between foods of animal origin and foods of non-animal origin in this regard. Also, we have received a number of questions about food supplements and their import requirements. And finally, I will briefly look at what you need to think about if you are planning to export to Great Britain from the 1st of January 2021. The main thing to note, though, is that EU food law has not changed. So when it comes to food labels, what do you need to do to ensure your labelling is compliant from the 1st of January 2021? EU food labelling legislation requires that the name and EU address of the food business operator responsible for the food information is provided. For products that require origin labelling, for example, honey or primary ingredients, from the end of the transition period, references to EU as the source of an ingredient cannot include ingredients from Great Britain. However, food products from Northern Ireland will still be able to use EU as the source of an ingredient from a food labelling perspective. Please note that only some food products have mandatory origin labelling. This should not be confused with custom origin labelling for customs declarations. Revenue.ie will be able to advise on any custom origin implications for your products. The identification mark is applied to foods of animal origin and indicates that it has been produced in an establishment approved in accordance with Regulation 853 of 2004. The format of the mark is set out in legislation and there are different requirements depending on whether the identification mark relates to an EU or a non-EU country. 
both the Great Britain identification mark and the Northern Ireland identification mark will change from the 1st of January 2021. A question we are often asked is whether all foods of animal origin need to have identification marks. Some foods like honey are not required to have an identification mark. Also, composite products containing both products of plant origin and processed products of animal origin do not need an identification mark. However, the processed products of animal origin used to prepare the composite products must be obtained and handled in establishments approved under Regulation 853 of 2004. But just remember, food law has not changed. So if the product did not need an identification mark before Brexit for the EU market, then it will not need an identification mark from the 1st of January 2021. So when it comes to the name and address, I would go, just go through some of the things that food businesses have sought clarification on. Firstly, there must be an EU food business address on the label. The name and address must be either the food business operator whose name or business name the food is marketed, or if that food business operator is not established in the EU, then the name and address of the importer into the EU market. At the end of the transition period, an address in Great Britain will not comply with this requirement, and therefore the name and address of the importer into the EU market must be used. When it comes to having a UK address and an EU address on the label, this is fine. A non-EU address can be indicated on the label in addition to the EU address. When it comes to a Northern Irish, Northern Irish address, the address of a food business operator established in Northern Ireland will continue to be accepted for the purposes of EU labelling. We are often asked about the use of web addresses and PO boxes. Using a web address on its own would not be acceptable, but can be provided in addition to a physical address. Likewise, a PO box set up in Ireland simply as a contact point for a food business based in Great Britain would not meet the requirement of a food business established in the EU. We've also been asked whether the requirements for established within the EU is there for food contact materials. Yes, it is. The name and address of the manufacturer, processor or seller responsible for placing food contact materials on the EU market must be established in the EU. This brings me nicely to what EU name and address can be used in a food label, which is a question we often get asked in many guises. For example, would an agent or an affiliate in the EU comply with the requirement for food business operator established in the EU? Well, the name and address needs to be a food business operator established in the EU whose name or business name the food is marketed under. So that means the food business responsible for the food information on the product and the accuracy of this information. Or it needs to be the name and address of the importer who would then be responsible for the presence and accuracy of the food information on the food label. Food labeling legislation refers to the definition of food business operator as laid down in Regulation 178 of 2002. This regulation defines food business operator as the natural or legal persons responsible for ensuring that the requirements of food law are met within the food businesses under their control. Food business is defined as any undertaking, whether for profit or not, and whether public or private, carrying out any of the activities related to any stage of production, processing, and distribution of food. So in summary, the address indication on the product must be of a food business operator who meets the requirements of the definition of a food business operator as set out in Regulation 178 of 2002. The requirements in terms of food which is placed on the market prior to the end of the transition period depends on whether it is a food of non-animal origin or a food of animal origin. Under the terms of the withdrawal agreement, food of non-animal origin that was lawfully placed on the EU or UK market before the end of the transition period may be further made available on the market of the EU or the UK and circulate between these two markets until it reaches its end user. However, this is not the case for foods of animal origin, such as meat, milk, eggs, and honey, or foods containing these products as an ingredient. Food of animal origin coming from Great Britain 
must comply with EU food law as of the end of the transition period, regardless of whether the food of animal origin has been placed on the market of Great Britain before the end of the transition period. We get asked lots of questions about what this means with regard to particular products. So I'll go through a few scenarios with you. So in the case of food of non-animal origin placed on the Irish market or the UK market before the end of the transition period, this food can circulate between these markets until the end of its shelf life. Nothing needs to be done to these products. No relabeling is required. In the case of food of animal origin and foods that have animal origin ingredients, placed on the market in Great Britain before the end of the transition period, for example, in a cold store. These products need to be relabeled with the new ID mark and EU address before they can be placed on the Irish market or the market of any other EU country. Now for food of animal origin placed on the Irish market, for example, in a supermarket before the end of the transition period. This food is placed on the EU market. Nothing needs to be done to these products. No relabeling is required. For food of animal origin placed on the market in another EU country, for example, in a cold store in France before the end of the transition period, this food can be sent to Ireland and remain on the Irish market without the, without the need to relabel. However, Please note, if you are using Great Britain as a route for transporting the food to Ireland from France, known as the land bridge, then you need to check the requirements in place for this. So I've been talking about uh, foods that have been placed on the, Irish, on the Irish market or on the European market before the end of the transition period. But you also need to think about foods being manufactured from the 1st of January 2021. Any food manufactured in Great Britain from the 1st of January 2021 for import into an EU country must comply with EU food law, including the requirement for an EU address and the new identification mark. So now just to talk a little bit about food supplements and the import requirements for food supplements. We are often asked which of the import requirements are relevant to food supplements. Well, that depends on the ingredients of the food supplements and whether they are foods of non-animal origin, foods of animal origin or composite products. Once you know the ingredients for food supplements, then you can use the FSAI's free e-learning module, Brexit Food Import Requirements, which is available on the FSAI website, to find out the requirements for importing food supplements. Today, Deirdre has taken you through the import requirements for foods of non-animal origin, and colleagues from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine and through the import requirements for foods of animal origin at our last Brexit bite. Remember food supplements also need to comply with food labelling requirements, which specifies the, the provision of the name and EU address of the food business operator responsible for the food within the EU is provided. So finally, just to mention exporting to Great Britain, the UK have published their border operating model which is called the Border with the European Union, Importing and Exporting Goods. This is a guide to the requirements for foods imported into Great Britain from the 1st of January, 2021, and is available on the UK government website. The UK government are introducing the requirements in three stages up until the 1st of July, 2021. There will be very little change on the 1st of January with documentary requirements and pre-notification needed from the 1st of April and full requirements coming in July. Check out these requirements in the border operating model for your products. We are often asked by Irish food businesses how the products should be labelled for the UK market. We would refer to the UK government website which has guidance on food and drink labelling changes as well as health and identification marks applicable from the 1st of January 2021. Hopefully I've clarified some things for you, but just to say that the FSCI has lots of resources available to help you get Brexit ready. Come to the Brexit section on our website at fsai.ie forward slash Brexit for links to all our resources. Now I'll hand you over to Maria for the question and answer session.
That's great. Thank you both Deirdre and Carol for that. Um, and um, I just uh, ask you a few questions because we've had lots of questions coming in. Um, so my first question is, um, uh, we bring in ready-made vegetarian and vegan meals from the UK that might be made using rice from China. Will those consignments be stopped for checks under the emergency checks? Deirdre, would you like to answer that one? Uh, so if the ready-made meals are manufactured in the UK, then no, that is not considered part of the controls. It's only if the meals would have been brought in from China directly through the UK without having, without having been um, uh, amended or added to or, or like they'd have been enforced as a whole but if there's any questions I would suggest you just send the documentation through to us and we will check it and then release it if there's no issue. Okay thanks Deirdre and then in, and another one um, for you um, this is in um, what official certificates will be required for example the the high-risk product uh, chili from India uh, supplied from the G, from GB so I presume that's where it's not included in the yeah. product but it, it so comes in. Basically, comes in the UK, in. yeah, so the, the certificates will have accompanied the product into the UK. So you just bring the same certificates with you when you're arriving into, into the EU, which would be Ireland. So you present those certificates that would have been provided from India with the product when arriving into the EU. And the, plus the CHED, um, the part one of the uh, common health entry document. And then uh, we had a question, is there a definitive list of high risk foods? Yeah, so that's the list that's in one of the attachments. Um, now that does change and that's the reason why we would ask that you contact us and we put on the mailing list so we can notify you all the time if there's any changes. Um, but that list is uh, for the foods of uh, non-animal origin, uh, excluding the pesticides, pesticides do their own list, but we have that list done out for our importers so that they can very quickly see all those high risk foods and the country of origin um, from where that applies. And uh, we, we had um, a question in relation to the arrangements during um, during COVID. So are there any easements um, uh, to, uh, to help uh, importers um, in relation to um, getting their, their imports in at the moment? So, um, we, have all re we have always been accepting scanned copies of um, certificates and that has been the case for high risk foods of non animal origin um, from our side for many years. I've been in post for five years and they've been accepted as a scanned copy since then. I do know that the vets have taken some um, changes and they're accepting things in scans, but you'd have to contact them regarding that because they had the requirement to physically present. We've never had that requirement to physically present the original certificate. We will accept it as a scanned copy. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Deirdre. And um, kind of linked to that then is um, um, how do you identify whether you should uh, register with DAFM or um, with yourselves in um, the uh, environmental health um, um, for imports? So we're not we're not asking you to register with us. We're just asking you to inform us at the moment, and then we'd be able to look at the products you're importing, and if they are. Uh, the, the reason for registration would be if you were a HSE supervised premises. So that would be if you have, you will know yourself if you have environmental health officers coming into your premises to do the normal food hygiene checks. That would mean you're a HSE supervised premises. Um, but at the import level, we're just asking you to inform us if you have, um, if you're importing, and then if you're importing of foods of high risk foods of non animal origin or just um, foods of non animal origin, we will put you on our list and we will come back and contact you and ask you any queries if we need to know that. Okay, Thank, thanks Deirdre. And then we had uh, um, a question in relation to um, um, uh, why would a product be rejected um, uh, when it came into the port? Um, so it might be rejected on a documentary check. Um, so it might be that uh, the documents haven't been provided fully to us or they haven't been able to answer queries to us or they haven't got the associated lab certificates that might be needed. Um, it could be rejected after sampling. So it might be that we have passed that documentary check and then we've gone in to sample it and the sample has come back unsatisfactory from the lab. Um, and that doesn't happen that often. Uh, in most cases, uh, if the documents are fine, it, we get the odd time we'll get like high levels of alpha toxins in spices or in um, other products. But most of our checks go through um, and are satisfactory. Um, 
really the document checks if they're satisfactory then uh, and you get pulled for physical exam and that is in order then you progress through the port no problem okay that's great thanks thanks Deirdre and uh, now I'll, I'll turn to Carol um, um, with some questions that have been asked um, Carol um, the question here is there likely to be a period of grace to allow the UK product to be relabeled to comply with the new rules uh, no no, the, 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 I suppose the transition period, we've had the transition period and we're, we're in a transition period at the moment. So now everything has to start complying from the 1st of January 2021. But you do need to take into account um, what I was saying in relation to products that are placed um, on the market. So if it's a product from non-animal origin, then it can go between the UK and the EU market um, once it is placed on the UK market and um, before the transition period, once it reaches its end. Okay, so yeah, yeah. And a similar one. Uh, what about products of animal origin imported from GB in transit um, on the 31st of December? Would they require the new ID mark? Anything that arrives into Ireland um, after the transition period, which um, in, in Brussels is 12 midnight, but it's actually 11 o'clock here Irish time, and would need to comply with um, the EU labeling requirements. So, um, so all of the requirements that I went through earlier uh, that the product needs to comply. But as I say, food products of animal origin, there, there's differences with the food products of non-animal origin. That's fine. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. Um, and um, are, um, I have a question here. Are, um, are the controls um, going to be the same for product coming in through Northern Ireland? And as I, I suppose I said, that there is um, very little change between any um, of the trade. There's no change between the trade between Ireland and, and Northern Ireland. Um, so is that in relation to labelling, Maria? Um, what any changes that need to be made in relation to labelling? There wouldn't be any changes, but you need to take into account that uh, NI will have a new uh, ID mark. Um, so you have to take that into account. Okay, okay, thanks. Um... Yeah, and there's, a, there's a, another one there. Can I double check labelling requirements? If we sell product in Northern Ireland, our current EU address will suffice and we will not need to change. Is that correct? Yes. Um, then whatever they're currently using, as long as it's not a UK address, um, only on the label or a GB, sorry, a Great Britain, British address only on the label. So a Northern Irish address is fine um, or any EU member state address is fine, um, but, a, EU, but a, a Great British address is no longer compliant after the 1st of January 2021, but it can be on the label in addition to me. Okay, and um, um, a question here, uh, we're a, um, a, a GB company. If we were to set up our own company in Ireland for the purposes of complying with the FBO address requirements, would someone need to be fully employed by our company or could we use a secretary service instead? And as long as they fulfill the requirements within Regulation 178, um, so that they are an actual food business operator and um, that, they, that they are carrying out um, one of the food business uh, or what comes under the definition of a food business, then they are, would be considered a food business operator in Ireland. And for that, they would need to contact the likes of um, Deirdre um, or Deirdre's colleagues within the HSC or the Department of Agriculture the local authority fishery or the sea fishery protection authority so they're they're the agencies that look after um, premises within ireland so they need to contact whichever one is relevant to them depending on what the product is and go through that uh, process with them to, to to ensure that they are fulfilling the requirements within regulation 178 okay great thanks carl and then uh, there's a question on food supplements um when do we need to amend the um i presume they mean the label when do we need to um to include an EU FBO address. Um, yeah, so as I say, for food supplements, and, and the reason we introduced it into this uh, webinar was that people really couldn't identify themselves within the, the information that we've been um, giving out, that they couldn't see where food supplements fitted into that. So really food supplements are foods that are either foods of animal origin, food of non-animal origin, or complete products. And in that regard, if it's a food of non-animal origin, if that product was on either the UK or EU market before the end of the transition period, then that product can go between those two markets until it reaches its end user without the need for changing the label, so without the need for changing the address. If the food supplement has animal origin ingredients in it, then that, uh, that change would need to be made from, the, from any product 
uh, being made available on the EU market, including Ireland, from the 1st of January. Okay, that's, that's great. Thanks, Carol. Um, yeah, um, I'll just get one, one last question. I think we have time for one last question here. Um, yep. Um, okay, and um, okay, and a straightforward one now. Um, can the, can the Northern Ireland identification remark you be used prior to first of January? No, no. Um, I suppose then the per, up to the to the thirty first of December at eleven o'clock, the EU um, or the UK is is uh, is in I suppose in the EU for. For terms, it's no longer it won't be a third country until um until the the first of January. So therefore, it has to comply with the current EU legislation up to that point. The current EU legislation is the current ID mark, and um, that is being used. Once the transition period is over, they need to comply with uh, EU uh, legislation or the importing into an EU country. So therefore, they can only use the mark for when when uh, when that situation happens. So no, you can't use it for product placed on the market before uh, the, the end of the transition period, but you need to place it to use it for product placed on the market after the transition period. Okay, that's great. So um, thanks Deirdre and Carol um, for um, all your, your presentations and, um, and your, your, um, your answers to the questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions this morning. And if we didn't cover your question, um, you might like to email us on um, Brexit at fsai.ie. And as Deirdre noted, if you're an importer of food of non-animal origin, um, uh, food contact materials or the composites that you mentioned there, uh, you can contact them on importcontroldublin at hse.ie or importcontrolrosslare at hse.ie, um, depending on which port you'll be using. And we'll be um, uh, compiling a question and answer um, document um, uh, following the questions generated by the Brexit Bite series. And we'll be making that available on the FCA website. And if you'd like to get any more information, as Carol mentioned, there's lots of information on our website um, on Brexit related information. Um, and fsai.ie forward slash Brexit. So a big thanks to everyone for joining us today and for participating in the poll and for your questions. Um, this webinar session um, has been recorded and will be available on the FSAI website and YouTube channels after the event. Um, it will also be linked at the bottom of the follow-up email that you'll receive. Um, and I ask you to take a few moments, please, to complete the event survey, which will pop up after we close the webinar and will also be linked in the follow up email that we'll send you all. We'd appreciate your feedback on it. Um, we run regu regular webinars um, and to subscribe to these, um, please visit fsai.ie forward slash subscribe. Uh, many thanks for joining us today and best of luck with your preparations for the 1st of January. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Bye bye.